Sounds great. Well, welcome everybody to our information webinar on Path to Agility. What we have planned today is to kind of walk through the framework, introduce you to it. Uh, that should take kind of the first half of the webinar and we'll walk you through the elements and uh, how you can get uh, more involved with Path to Agility and using Path to Agility, uh, go through those options. And then um, we uh, will open it up for Q&A for the, the back half. Um, so that's what we have planned. Hello from Berlin. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm David Hawks and uh, let's jump in. So the first thing that I want to kind of hit on is the premise of why we created Path to Agility and what problems we see in the market in kind of this agile transformation market, agile transformation, transition, adoption, whatever you want to call it. The, the recent State of Agility uh, report came out and it's still to me a little bit of the same old, same old. Um, I've been doing this survey for the last three years of uh, kind of all the talks that I've done across the uh, different conferences and, um, you know, and, and speaking and just kind of asking the community, like, how would you rate your current level of agility? And we have seen uh, some interesting results. And one of the things that's been really interesting is the consistency of these results. So uh, every, I've, I've done this, we've had over 500 organizations um, uh, kind of, you know, looking at some of the scatter plot, and we've got 30% that are in this state of superficial agility, what I call kind of like putting agile lipstick on a waterfall pig. It's like, like we're going through the motions, but we're not actually uh, really doing agile. We're probably doing more, you know, scrummer fall or wagile. Um, it looks, it, it probably is delivering more like waterfall than it is uh, truly getting things done, carry over from sprint to sprint. And then we have this 50% that have been in improving agility, which means, all right, we're getting some improvement, but we're, we're maybe stuck. You know, it, 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 you know, I find that people are stuck in improving and not actually getting out into these higher levels of predictability and, and getting more faster speed. And so we only see 15 you know, percentage uh, around predictable and 5% around fast. And I don't even ask in the survey the fifth level of agility that we, we define in path to agility um, because most organizations aren't even there. I mean, if we only have you know, 3% and fast, then we're not really getting there. And like I said, most of the time I see these percentages when I do this survey move maybe within a 5% boundary, but, but it's been very consistent um, over this time. And so it started to force me to kind of ask why, why are, why are people getting stuck? We've got 80% of our market and these are at conferences of agilists, right? So you, you think these are people that are, should be doing it the best. Um, so we had 80% and a, a self-assessment is a little bit more biased towards the positive. So 80% that haven't achieved what kind of agile promises um, and the benefit, the full benefits of what we promise. So why are we getting stuck? And so we started to look at uh, different elements here. And these are just kind of some of the top 10 that, um, that, that resonate with me is that, that I've seen over and over. Um, and number one, I think is the, the one of the biggest issues. I, I think most organizations are uh, failing at achieving the benefits because they're focused on the wrong thing. They're focused on kind of like we're implementing everything in the picture, right? We're trying to do all the scrum things. We're trying to do all the safe things. We're trying to do all the Kanban things. And they're starting with practices and the how without clearly creating a compelling why. And then they're, so therefore they're measuring the wrong thing. It's like, check, check, check. We're doing all the practices as opposed to check we're getting faster, check, we're delivering quicker, we're getting better, more value out the door, or we're doing things in a more predictable way. And so if our measuring stick is just that we're doing the things, well, surprise, going through the motions is doing the things. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're doing them well. And so we wanna focus on 
uh, not implementing the practices, but achieving the results. And so that ties into number five, right? Like it's, what is our purpose and is that tied into business outcomes? So that's, that's one of the biggest themes that we see. Um, the second theme that we see a lot, and, and we've seen this and this is starting to shift, which is good, uh, I would say the first, uh, you know, like manifestos 2001, I would say for the first 10 years, um, even maybe 15, for the first 10 to 15, we saw everything very focused at team level agility. So it was all about, let's just get teams doing Scrum um, and teams doing XP. And then, and then it was teams doing Kanban. But there was all this focus on team level agility and uh, luckily, you know, we see all sorts of scaling frameworks that have emerged over the last 10 years. And uh, because now there's this emphasis and this realization that companies, uh, it's not just a team level problem. It's also a, a system level problem and an organizational and cultural and leadership problem. And, and so that's good. There's now awareness and we're starting to see companies who are doing like their next transformation. It's like we did a team level transformation we were hired with a client a couple of years ago where the, the number one thing they said was we did a team level transformation and now we need to, we realize we focus on the organization. So maybe the goodness out of the team level transformation is it created awareness that there's a bigger thing and leaders maybe couldn't understand that until they started seeing some team level agile. So the good news is our leaders have learned from team level agile about how it could apply in other, other places in the organization and how it needs to kind of carry up in terms of um, other areas. Um, so, so those to me are some of the key things that we'll, we'll hit on as I kind of introduce uh, the, the path to agility framework. But ultimately, it's, it's, we've got to focus on business outcomes. We've got to focus on more than team level. And, uh, and then a common, common thing we see a lot uh, with our, our consulting practice is that as number seven, that we get a lot of times like the, the phone will ring and somebody says, we need help. We need to do, you know, be better at agile. We need to do agile, whatever, you know, they're kind of saying. And they think they just need to train everybody. Like if we could just do training, then we're smart people, we'll figure it out. And so realizing that training is just one step on this journey and education is just one step. Um, learning and and figuring this stuff out is a, is a lot harder and, and so we'll walk through kind of that journey and kind of create that map for that. So that's kind of the premise, some of the premise behind why we created Path to Agility. And just to kind of provide a little bit of an overview, uh, what we're trying to provide with the framework is guidance for the Agile transformation that's very geared towards outcomes um, and not, not geared for, towards practices. Like we've got lots of frameworks around practices um, and uh, there's a lot of things packed in the, in the picture, uh, uh, you know, if you know which one I'm talking about. Um, but we wanna have something that's outcome-based and, and allows us to get tangible steps and be able to identify, almost assess, like where are we and where do we need to go next? Um, because it's a huge landscape when we put the, the picture of all the agile things out there. It's a huge landscape to navigate and it's even hard for experienced coaches for us to navigate, let alone uh, for somebody that's, that's newer or, or earlier in their, in their kind of learning journey. So, um, so that's definitely a, a real big key for it. And, and so when we started, we started thinking about, we took just kind of look at it from a change management perspective. And what we've done with Path to Agility is taken some change management, organizational uh, change management practices and combine them with agile adoption patterns into Path to Agility. Because as, as many of you know, uh, adopting agile is an organizational change and we need to manage it in a deliberate way. So looking at just the uh, satire curve, you know, we, we all know that when we introduce change, we get worse before we get better, right? Like we go through this natural kind of human reaction that we call chaos and resistance because the rules just change. We change the rules on everybody. We say, you're now gonna do agile, you're now gonna do scrum, you're now gonna do safe, you're now gonna be a scrum master. And uh, that's a scary moment for a lot of people. Even if people are excited about the opportunity, there's also, there's a lot of stress and fear for, am I going to be successful? Will I, I was a hero. Will I be a hero in the new world? Like, 
there, and, and we as leaders and change agents got to recognize every time we ask a team to implement a new practice, a leader to shift their behavior, um, there we're asking them to go through this kind of little bit of a uh, curve and, and it's going to be hard for them and uncomfortable. We're, we're, every time we ask for them to do something different, we're, we're pushing them off this ledge into this kind of uncomfortable state. We've got to recognize that and support people and create safety through this journey and, and get them to kind of this state of integration and practice. And, you know, at the bottom of the curve is, is to me where uh, we learned that there's something new that we should do, but we're not good at it yet. And then we have to practice it and then get good at it and hopefully get to a new status quo and hopefully keep kind of going through uh, more, more learnings and more kind of J curves. I realized a number of years ago as, a, as an agile coach and an agile trainer, um, my number one purpose was to help organizations get through this curve faster and reduce the risk of how deep they go. Like that to me as coaches, that's, that's the value we provide. Um, we're, our job is to accelerate people through this learning journey because they could figure it out on their own. They might get stuck. We, like we have, you know, that 51% that are stuck in improving agility to me are stuck down at the bottom of this curve, just kind of churning. And um, because it gets difficult, right? You get into that chaos and resistance and it gets difficult. And then, so what happens when you get down to the bottom is a lot of people either turn there or run back, right? And, and if you're running back, that's, that's where that, you know, 21% uh, that were kind of stuck in the, you know, stuck in uh, superficial agility, right? Like it's, it's so, so a lot of people, if we say that 80%, that 80% is really in these first two parts of this curve, not getting through, um, we had an interesting LinkedIn thread this last week, uh, and I think it was Chris Gentry who kind of talked about, you know, leaders aren't making the changes that they need to. And we, and we had a little dialogue about, well, part of that problem is because leaders are just managing their silo and they're not optimizing across the whole, the whole thing, which again is taking a systems view to the problem. They're not taking a systems view to the problem, right? They're optimizing at a team level. So what we started to do with Path to Agility and these adoption patterns is look at kind of there's certain stages that we see uh, that folks are going through in, in critical kind of points. And the first one that we think is uh, really key is aligning, right? Aligning around why. Why are, we, why are we introducing change? Because if we're about to ask everybody to go through this, this kind of pain curve, um, then we better have everybody bought into the, what the new status quo is going to look like. Like, why are we about to ask everybody to change? And we got to get everybody bought into that. So everybody's rowing in the same direction, trying to treat, achieve that goal. And so we talk, talk a lot about alignment around the why, um, because, you know, you go to, I don't know how many of us have gone to a leader and said, you know, why, why are you doing agile? And they say, well, you know, to, to do, to be agile. Right. And it's like, all right, that's not a business outcome. Like business outcomes, like to deliver faster, to have happier customers, to have higher quality. Right. Like we need to get to the business outcomes and then we need to align around that. Then we get to the stage of learning and this starts with training, but that's that's not enough. Right. Two days in a classroom is not going to you're not going to be learned at that point. Right. You're going to be educated. You'll be aligned around the terminology. Um, but you haven't learned how to do it. You've learned what to do, but you haven't learned how to do it. And it takes practice for us to actually learn things. So, so learning is all about creating a continuous improvement culture, having meaningful retros at all levels of the organization. And are we actually putting into practice this, this learning to get to a state of predictability? Um, and we purposely have uh, stage three is predict and stage four is accelerate. And the reason for that is because we feel strongly that you got to get the, the get predictable before you can go faster, right? If you're not very predictable and you say go faster, right, you're just creating more noise in the system. So you've got to get predictable, get the variability out of the system as much as you can. You know, our, our work, you're never going to have uh, a, a, the same, same small variability as like a manufacturing line, but we can reduce the number of interruptions. We can create more focus. We can limit whip. We can do a lot of things to get less uh, very, but we can create more cross-functional teams. So we're not throwing things over the wall to people. 
right? So in predictability, sometimes we talk about scaling by descaling, by simplifying the system. Um, and then that allows us to get to accelerate and optimize the whole, optimize the whole uh, value stream, if you will. And then the final stage, I, I mentioned there was a fifth stage, you know, after fast agility, which is what we call adapt. And adapt is all about, are we responding quickly to what the market is demanding? Are we um, able to respond based on information in the market, right? Can we put something out there and test and learn quickly? This is where things like lean startup, build, measure, learn, experiment driven development come into play. But we can't respond, you know, we can't put a test out there and do small little tests if we can't get to accelerate and deliver quickly. And we won't get to that if we, if we have too much variability. We can't get to that if we don't have a learning culture and we won't ever get through this if we're not aligned around a mission that everybody's bought into. So those are the five key stages of, a, of, of the path to agility. And what we do is use these to start looking at, well, where, where are, are you and where are you at a team level? Where are you at a system level? Where are you at an organizational level? Now we're gonna do a, a, an exercise here in a quick a second. I'm gonna look to get a little bit of uh, some interaction. Um, I wanna introduce you to one of the places we start in that align stage, which is uh, I, uh, identifying what are the business outcomes. So Path to Agility is uh, one, of, one of the versions of the product is a, uh, a set of cards that come in a, in a box like this. And, uh, you know, those cards, you know, we've, we've, I've created here, but, but a lot of times what we'll do in a, uh, if we had everybody together, we'll show how you, we do this virtually a little bit later, but, um, you know, we take these cards and we run an exercise where we say, all right, let's pick, what are the two to three things out of this list that, um, you know, are the reasons why we are, are uh, embarking on this agile journey and trying to get leaders to align. Of course, you know, the first time I say you can, you know, pick two to three leaders are like, oh no, we need all, we need all nine. And I'm like, all right, first lesson of agile is limiting whips. So, all right, what are the two to three that we're going to, we're going to focus on and how do we start turning those into something measurable? So if you want to play along, um, if you want to look at that link there at the top, holtev.com slash velocity. So if you, uh, if you type that in, you should get to a, a survey. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to pick what do you think are the top three business outcomes that are most important to your organization um, out of, out of the, the three that are there. And Rez, maybe you can test and verify that that is, uh, looks like it's working, hopefully. Let's give everybody a chance to, to do that. There we go. All right, some answers are coming in. Um, so we'll see how the, how y'all's line up with, I'll share some of the patterns that I see. Um, and uh, so we've got an early leader. We'll see if that holds in customer satisfaction. And so as you're walking through this, you're probably realizing or you're commenting yourself, like there is, there is some dependency across these different things. There's a relationship. Um, some things lead to others, right? I, I just mentioned that it's hard to get to speed without predict going through predictability first. Um, so one, t one t you know, some of how we frame this is important when we ask leaders to prioritize. Um, time frame matters, right? So are we saying at the end of the agile transformation, we hope to have higher customer satisfaction, right? Customer satisfaction is maybe the ultimate goal. But if we ask the question that said, what do you need in the next three to six months to get to customer satisfaction in the next you know, two to three years, then that might change the answer. And so that's an important dialogue to have with leaders, right? It's like, we ultimately want customer satisfaction, but right now we need to focus on quality and speed, right? Maybe, you know, and that is important for leaders to be able to clearly communicate to their organization, again, to get alignment around what is the mission that we're asking everybody to go to so that everybody understands, why are you moving my cheese? Why are you changing how I'm working? Why, why are we even trying to do this stuff? 
Um, so, so it looks like 29% customer sat, 14% uh, employee engagement, 14% predictability, and then uh, speed. And, uh, and then we got a pretty good, pretty good balance. Oh, we got a late ad. So employee engagement is, uh, is number two. So I mentioned that there's a relationship amongst these things. And so um, what we started to do is start mapping out some of those, you know, you could probably relate everything to everything in some sense, but started to map out, all right, where is this relationship? And what's, what's really interesting is that a lot of this starts with employee engagement. Right. If our employees aren't engaged, if if we have morale problems, if we have retention problems, if we have a bill, you know, inability to attract top talent, then uh, then we're going to have a hard time getting, you know, continuous improvement and getting quality and getting predictability. But ultimately, all of these will move the needle on customer satisfaction. Right. So, um, you know, it starts it. So so there's there's uh, an interesting relationship as you work through and saying, all right, we maybe need to work on employee engagement so we can get to customer satisfaction. Um, now, I mentioned that there's kind of some different levels and I've kind of thrown these out and let me walk through them. So the team level clear. Everybody typically understands that where team level practices, scrum, Kanban, things like that are happening. And we've been doing that well for you know 20 something years. So we're, we're you know we've we've been figuring out how to do uh, team level agility, where the scaling frameworks have come into play. Whoops, the wrong way. Um, is what I call the system level, right? The, if you think about the system level as the flow of value delivery, right? The system, the network of teams that uh, that takes you know multiple teams to get value out the door. This is where our scaling frameworks help us a lot. This is where cross-team coordination comes into play, communities of practice, all of those types of things are at the system level to optimize the flow of value through the system. And most, many organizations as we scale have multiple systems or multiple products that are, that are involved. Um, and then there's an organizational level where we talk about things like our leadership, our culture and mindset, um, or how it ties into our strategy, um, our organizational structure, but also our, our people practices, our finance practices. Uh, many organizations, especially at the enterprise, are struggling with, we're trying to do agile, but we still have a very heavy project-based funding budgeting process, right? And, and that is at odds with each other. So there's organizational things that we need to do. And so what we've done with these different levels is we've kind of gone through and we say, all right, those can nest in as we get to larger organizations. Um, but then we said, what are all the agile outcomes that we're trying to accomplish um, in these stages and created this map of here's all the things we're trying to do. Um, not again, not in a practice oriented way, but in an outcome and capability based way. Here's the things we're trying to achieve, I should say, at the org system and team level and at these various stages throughout the path to agility. And what we're able to do with this is start having organizations and teams and, and leaders uh, assess, self-assess, have we achieved uh, the ability to focus? Have we achieved faster time to value? Have we reduced complexity? Do we have visibility to all of our work? Do we even have teams aligned to value? Right? Like we start asking those questions and that starts to get us aligned in the right direction versus just saying, are you doing daily scrums? Are you doing retros? Right? That's not near as important as our teams taking ownership of their work. Um, and, and so we started to map this out and we're able to start uh, visualizing uh, kind of where we are and make, making clear decisions of where should we focus next? Because there's 30 things on this map and there's, you know, there's all sorts of dependencies we see here, but these 30 things, like we can't do all 30 of them at once. Um, now, there is some dependency a little bit left to right, um, but we're, we're not saying you have to do everything in a line before everything and learn, That's, that, that would be waterfall. Um, and there's times when you might need to focus, like we had a, a new organization, which they picked one of their top three to focus on right away was, was actually ability to focus. And, and uh, which is all the way in predict. I said, why, why are you jumping all the way there? And they said, well, our leaders are changing priorities every week. And if we don't start addressing our ability to focus, it doesn't matter what we do at the team level. So it starts to help create the right dialogue to what is it that we need to focus on right now? 
how do we limit whip around our transformation? Um, and, and you say, how does this tie into the business outcomes, the yellow cards that you voted on earlier? Well, we could start mapping to say, well, if you said employee engagement was number one, well, then these six agile outcomes may be the place to start, right? These are the areas that if these are red, then that's probably leading to employee engagement is low. If these are red, then this is probably what's leading to quality being low, right? And so it starts to help us dissect, all right, these 30 things, where are the areas we should start given what's the, what's the business outcome that we're trying to achieve? So we start looking at each of these elements and we can use this information to start correlating into, all right, what, what's the area that we wanna focus on? Now, each of those agile outcomes, the 30 things that were in that map a, a second ago, break down into a lower level of capabilities. So the relationship here is that we've got business outcomes, the nine, nine kind of yellow cards that we looked at that, that dictate which priorities we have in these agile outcomes, the 30 that were on the map. Um, and those are achieved through agile capabilities. So we've identified over a hundred agile capabilities that are sub components of the agile outcomes of things that we're trying to achieve. Now we do that by implementing agile practices, right? So here's where SAFE or Scrum or Kanban or any of the other things come in. So we've mapped all of those, those, those frameworks into how does that help us achieve the stuff up here? We don't need to recreate, you know, there's plenty of scaling, frame, there's plenty of implementation frameworks to choose from. Um, and we got a lot of guidance, but those things enable and drive and accomplish our, our higher level things that we're trying to achieve. So there's this relationship and the first three levels here um, are, are kind of what we've mapped out within Path to Agility. So the framework hits on the business outcomes, agile outcomes, and agile capabilities. And so you start breaking down, this is just a zoom in kind of view of the org level of align, learn, and predict. And we see like within that, the, these boxes are the capabilities within each of those areas. And so those capability cards that are that are in this, this other box, right? The, the capabilities, uh, these 100 capabilities, each of those cards have uh, kind of a description and on the back then they have this clear acceptance criteria of if we achieve these things, then that's what's helping us identify, have we achieved the capability? And again, these aren't written in a do this, you know, if you know, it's not a practice, it's saying, this is how do we define that we have the capability uh, in, the, in, in it. And so from a product perspective, what we've outlined here pretty quickly, right, in 30 minutes is to say uh, there's nine business outcomes, the five stages, the three levels, and these 30 agile outcomes that break down into these 100 capabilities. And that's what's really the framework. The framework is uh, all of these components uh, that we've been working on uh, and to, again, help organizations start to build kind of like a transformation backlog and transformation roadmap and an ability to assess in an outcome and capability driven way versus just uh, assessing based on practices. So that's what um, kind of in a nutshell, all the different pieces of the framework that manifest themselves. in uh, we've got all of these, these cards that, that I kind of mentioned, um, but we've also, uh, you know, due to our, our current uh, situation, we've also started virtualizing. So here's a, a mural board, uh, like a virtual whiteboard of our Path to Agility cards and showing like uh, doing a business outcomes. Uh, this is facilitated with leaders uh, uh, dot voting, as well as on the right, you see kind of a, a self-assessment where we had people put, you know, green green, yellow, red, based on self-assessing at, at each of those levels so that we can, and how we facilitate some of these workshops uh, in, a, in a virtual way. Uh, just wanna give kind of a sense. And then what we do with this is we start visualizing. Um, and so you see here, like what, which outcomes are we working on at org level, system level, and each team could be a different place along kind of the uh, path to agility uh, you know, roadmap, right? Like where, where are they? Start, we start visualizing if we do this on a, on, a, on, a, on a wall, you know, or if we do that in a tool, um, either way it can work. And we start creating visualizations like this. It says, hey, we're red here, we're yellow here, we're, we're green here. And that starts again to give us a sense of where, where do we focus on next? And we can bake that down all the way into a capability level. We've created different radar charts and other things off of that as well. And just to kind of close and kind of tie things in, it's like, all right, so what, all right, great. 
great. How do I, how do I use this framework if you're interested? Um, so these are just kind of the, the different things that we have available. So um, there's two certifications around uh, that give you access to the framework. And one is the Path to Agility Practitioner. Um, and the next class is actually next Thursday, I think for a week from today. Um, and this is targeted for people within an organization. So in, internal change agents, um, this could be a change agent, you know, scrum master, could be a change agent leader, uh, could be an internal coach. Um, and so people within the organization that are trying to lead change. And so uh, going through this class will introduce you to the framework in depth, uh, more than a 30 minute webinar. And, um, and start teaching you that tool. And then you have access to uh, the product, to, to Path to Agility, to the deck of cards, to the virtual boards, to be able to, uh, to use those as you're, as you're helping and, and get the guidance on how, to, how do I use this within uh, leading change in my organization. So that's a practitioner. The facilitator is, uh, the day after, is actually June 12th. Uh, the facilitator is geared more towards external, uh, co you know, professional coaches, uh, consultants who are um, helping organizations. So the facilitator is for folks who are um, going into organizations and helping those change agents, helping those path to agility practitioners. Um, so the facilitator um, also is a, is a, a day class does require um, you know, previous transformation experience. And so there, there are some prerequisites to be qualified for the facilitator. Um, and then facilitators can uh, certify practitioners um, within those organizations. So they're, they're able to do that. Um, and then uh, on top of that, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, 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 somewhere, you know, 30, north of 30 uh, different path to agility facilitators that you can leverage from a coaching support perspective. Um, in a couple different ways. So uh, coming and just doing a, a private at, you know, if you had enough change agents and wanted to do a path to agility practitioner certification training for your change agents, um, the facilitator network could provide that. Um, if you need path to agility implementation, implementation coaching support, um, both to help with getting the practitioners, but also supporting them, you know, because uh, a day of training, again, what did I say earlier, like you're armed and very dangerous. So uh, getting the support to go uh, implement. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, you know, some of our, our partner facilitators as well as Agile Velocity um, can provide kind of those full transformation services and provide, you know, kind of embedded coaching uh, along that journey, both at a leadership level as well as a team level. Um, around uh, path to agility. And uh, I think that was my last slide. Okay, so that's kind of path to agility and all of its pieces.